are disciplined, become disciplined to support daily living. I'm also pleased to report to you that we developed that capacity as we moved from the reductionism of the natural sciences to the general system theorizing of the many, of the many disciplines. And then I went on to doubt, as I always do in my articles, I have what I call the Howard Cosell tendency. When everybody wants to look at the action, I'm there preaching. <laughs> the prescriptions from physicians cannot help us regain an understanding of the reconstitution of the human work capacity if these prescriptions are from physicians who do not understand this concept, nor can they be understood from the treatment plans of occupational therapists who do not understand this concept. I said it can't be implemented, this kind of behavior, in cramped clinics, nor can it be implemented with scrap material. Okay, now that was the start point. And I seldom reread re anything that I have written and published, but in forcing myself to go back and reread uh, the work I have done in the last 20 years, because I think it was AOTA wanted to put out some kind of a monograph, and I felt I should reread my old stuff, I got terribly discouraged as I went through my articles thinking, what does it take to, the uh, to get the field to listen to some of these issues and problems? Because if we had done this at this time, this at this time, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in now. But when I reread uh, the Clark Slagle, I became quite optimistic about us again. Now, I want to talk about the stopping places that we had as we went along. Now, remember, I began with the start, the idiot position. I'm moving now toward some of the stopping places that we learned. To stop, to think, to reflect, and to reorganize a new form of coherence about our work. I call these insights and truth, and I think it was Winston Churchill that said about truth, that men, men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves off, pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. We learned when we got an insight or an epiphany to stop, to wonder about it, to put it into some kind of a crazy rule, and then around that rule from strategies and tactics. Now, my, I think I have um, four insights. The first is that the most reliable and valid name for the behavior we were studying turned out to be occupation or occupational. We found that most of the disciplines, particularly the social disciplines and biology and philosophy, tended to use this broad gauge category or classification. We found that work or vocational was a subsystem. And that occupational behavior is consistent with national and international taxonomy. And we were pleased to see the good sense of our early founders confirmed by recognized taxonomists of the knowledge structures. We found that the critical process of occupational behavior for the group was productivity. The critical process for the occupational behavior of the individual was competency. Insight number two, occupational behavior specifies the general nature of occupational therapy. Now, as one moves, from specialty to specialty in practice. You could perceive a deja vu, experience about flashes that you get of bits and pieces of commonality. 
but you can never piece it together to get a general sense of what it is that we do from within a specialty field. Occupational behavior encompasses a view of OT beyond the narrow specialties, and as such is superordinate to the subordinate specialties. Insight number three. Occupational behavior is a medical construct and exists in the juncture of the curing and the caring process. When the curing instrumentations of drug surgery and psychotherapy fail to cure, the environmental adaptation training of occupational behavior seeks to reorganize the residual competency. <coughs> the difficulty of this task would have been well anticipated by the ancient Greeks, who would have been quick to recognize the hubris, the arrogance, of accepting another discipline's failure for our success and would have anticipated the nemesis which we deserve. The burden of producing the improbable solution for impossible problems. So that if you find that you are dumb about your work. It is that the complexities that you deal with are simply smarter than you are. Now, the final one, insight number four. The historical analysis of the occupational therapy experience proves beyond a reasonable doubt that there is a strong and a positive relationship between profound multiple disability and occupational therapy technology. The greater the combination of disabilities, the more the OT service is fascinated. And as I proposed in my Clark Slagle again, OT is a depository of the traditional concern in the American society for those rendered helpless and dependent by disease and, in, and injury. Now this I would like to call our franchise from society, our social contract with society. Now it is possible for occupational therapy to rewrite that contract, but it cannot be done from within the association. Now, with the idea of franchise set, I would like to talk about the other characteristics, mention the other characteristics whereby our potentiality for greatness can be seen. This is the commitment or tenure the commitment, the tenure, and the legitimacy of our work. By commitment, I mean that we have been involved in all of the major disabilities since we began. And not just the mild, the real weirdies. <laughs> By tenure, I mean that our uninterrupted 60 years of education and treatment of these disabilities gives us tenure. By literacy, I mean the power of learned capacity to deal authoritatively with disabilities is already in place in OT. Now this leads me to summarize again and repeat in another form by continuous existential anxiety over the continued viability of our service. From our very beginning, it has been up for grabs as to whether the improbable venture of occupational therapy would survive, never mind succeed. Our danger, and it is especially critical now, 
and that is that we may at last and finally fail as a known discipline because we cannot comprehend the great institution that we are. And it is this failure of will and the need to refresh it and the need to reorganize and refresh our body of knowledge that I feel strongly is the next order of business for our state associations. where you have to kind of weed out what in the world is happening when information from the environment around objects and people is deficient or discrepant from what has previously happened to you in past experiences. What is stated is that each of these situations where curiosity is evoked and conflict exists represent a puzzle to be solved or clarified by action, must be solved or clarified by action. In each of these situations, rules are generated, symbols, categories that you use later. If, what's most amazing about this, is if there's no conflict, novelty in the environment, which a lot of our patients do not have. I mean, look at the board and care, look at the convalescent home. But usually, a healthy system will generate it. Ours, many don't. Okay, but it's very critical for the organism to generate the spontaneity. Okay. All right. What further work by Berline and Schachtel showed that for curiosity and this exploration to puzzle at, what's critical for that is the organism must be aroused or alert, kind of in tune to, hmm, some, something's happening. Um, to understand the system of arousal, you must conceptualize neurology as it is known in this country differently. If you take what you now know in your book, which says this structure and this is the output, and you try to understand what I'm about to say, it won't make any sense, okay? The best thing to do is to read Berline to understand this. What he said is unlike um, many aspects of looking at neurology in the central nervous system is that this arousal that alerts the system is both has a physical dimension, as we usually understand, basis of action, as well as a psychological. This is a really toughie to understand. Um, and it depends upon the interaction of the brainstem, brainstem reticular formation, the limbic system, and the cerebral cortex. If it, if you, what they found is if you try to um, understand by just looking at spe these specific structures and, and um, kind of uh, go ahead and use current scientific method, you don't have an understanding of this because what's critical in this is that the internal structures of symbols, the goals you have can also arouse man to be to wonder what's about. And you just can't look at a brain and find the symbols. <clears throat> in conclusion, what you'll find, what's important about this, is that only when the organism is aroused can the organism absorb information about what's going on through its sense organs, then impart meaning by processing in the CNS, the meaning in this sense will be the rule. And the output is purposeful action, not just exercise. Okay. Oh, sure. Okay. 
What you'll find is only when the organism is aroused that the organism is then able to absorb information through its sense organs. That's the first step. The input of the sense organs is processed into meaning, not just motion as in sensory motor paradigm, but into meaning. And the output is not just motion, but is purposeful action, habits that Gary will speak about, skills that Cindy talked about, and even role is purposeful action that Jan Matsusuyu talked about. In many of our patients, there's disorganization on different levels, as you'd expect in the system of looking at arousal exploration, curiosity exploration. Um, in physically disabled patients, I think the classic thing you can say, well, you know, a lot of them have a dampened arousal system and just are so lethargic, kind of sitting in their wheelchair, kind of almost falling over, um, losing their balance, <laughs> as in stroke sometimes. You can say, well, the cortex has been damaged and therefore the arousal system may be out. This may be true. The other explanation you can seek is there may be damage to the reticular activating system of the brain stem, and this also can explain it. But the other thing that's so critical to understand about arousal is that also the system can be dampened by boredom in the environment, that there's just not enough novelty in their life, not enough things to puzzle about, not enough, their roles have been, their roles have been disrupted, as Janet Sue talked, I hope. Oh, boo, okay, well, okay, the roles have been disrupted and there's no purposeful, uh, purposeful activity. And, and that will also dampen the arousal system. Okay. Does that make sense without having um, Jan come in? Yeah, speaking about roles. Joanne, you're looking puzzled. Couldn't also the threat of noticing reality make people defend by blocking off all new stimuli? I think. And what is for them a new yeah, I think you can get a cycle where a, a stroke will disrupt the skills you have and make it very threatening and lower the system. Okay, you'll see unspontaneity. Yeah, and you can see it. This, the whole notion of, I think the best knowledge on that would be to turn to the benign and vicious cycles of um, M. Brewster Smith and urge to competence and I'm not sure which year. Yes? Just so we're all thinking about the same thing. Can you mm -hmm. That's a toughie. There's not a lot enough known about what is purposeful action. I think the best, the simplest definition is the one that, um, that Bruner uses around skill, that the individual has an objective, he knows the means to seek it, and he knows how it gets feedback when the objective is fulfilled. For, um, there, and there are probably, the other thing that's known about, I think it's a basic definition, is there's probably a hierarchy that every day we see it in the clinic, I bet. The simple to complex purposeful activities that you need. There's simple to complex rules to accomplishment, accomplish them. This is not known, but we kind of have natural places to look at that, unlike any other discipline. Now, if you have a patient who has no skills and tools, often the, this, what this information would say is perhaps there's a deficit, often there's a deficit in the arousal system. There's no spontaneity, no exploration. The intervention for this is to find the just right conditions in the environment which evoke it. For physically disabled patients, sometimes exploration is evoked by looking at their past experiences. What was fun to them? Okay, um, you can start there and then begin to build the skills they need to deal with their role. Okay, other people, the traditional way of looking at this is, gee, the patient's unmotivated, he's uh, stubborn, and psychiatry, they love to call it resistive <laughs> to change, and that's not always the case. The conditions, it's really fun to look for conditions because every individual is different. 
Within adults, often you have to look at the safest environment was often the exploration they had as a child. Maybe it's fishing that they really liked before they came in. And that's the start point from which to gain the context of the motion they need, perhaps, as well as uh, the strategies they need to compensate for perceptual deficits. Yeah, mm -hmm. just, no, help. Okay. Well, but like fishing, take that example. And even if it is, okay, let's look at the motions you don't have, or compensatory motions. Um, it happens, you know, you can bring people around by their interests and really uh, pulling those out. And the, the interests um, would be one source for this whole new context of um, <coughs> treatment. Okay, within exploration, what's critical about it is Within the, within the fishing thing, you begin to maybe revitalize your old rules you had around objects and generate the strategy of rather than I just can't do nothing because my arm doesn't work into, well, I'll go ahead and try something new. They begin to generate and get into a cycle that, uh, a cycle of efficacy where they may take, more likely to take what they've learned in the clinic home. The other place that the other thing about exploration is that I don't know, and this is, this is not known in literature, it's not even talked about, is it's, no, it is talked about. The critical thing about, for instance, within physical disabilities, of not having flexible enough strategies to take it home with. What the rule would say about this is every environment has different rules, okay? You have to kind of know what's expected of you. All of us are kind of civilized in school and in play to know what those rules are. So you're ruled. You have rules. You're not ruleless. For in order to gain this, you've had to play with and try it out lots of different environments because everyone's different. And in physically disabled, as Dee Dee said in their position paper, it may be very critical to go to the home if they've learned some habits of basic habits. You need to go to the home and have them do them there. Do you want to add anything to that? Okay. Okay. All right. What if they're in the home and you want them to get out? Oh, that's a toughie. I think once again. And that environment became safe. Yeah, too safe. I think maybe what you can do is kind of, once again, the just right conditions may be to look to the past what they, they did. Like, for instance, maybe when they were in the 20s, they liked to play bridge, they really liked it. Um, the other context for them learning this is actually, you know, getting on the bus with a patient from their home, I was learning by doing, going to a senior citizen's place where they, I know in California that's a, you know, they, they play a lot of cards, but it's almost, you'd have to go through the, kind of the rules within that context of the environment they're in. But the critical thing is to identify what arouses them and just right. Other conditions, we talked about like the activity as a content of what rouse. Other conditions that are critical is a playfulness. You know, you can, you can say, well, let's go try it today. If it doesn't work, then, then we'll work it out. You know, it's, you're not going to, you know, it'll be okay. You provide safety. The other thing you, of playfulness is you have to show the many ways you can do it. Many ways to skin a cat becomes critical and let them have the chance to choose them is another condition of this. Um, another in practice, you'll find other conditions of safety include the number of, um, well, in pediatrics, you call it peers, but just how many people they have around. Just is a, is a tremendous conflict. It's overload for many of these people. And to find an environment that's safe enough with fewer people, for instance, and then move into more and more complex environments where they kind of get a feel for basic rules and then move into more complex environments. Maybe a senior citizen may be too much sometimes. You find a small environment, a quieter one. Another uh, well, another point would be too, like using past history and identifying wow. the components. Uh, my concern would be too that we make the assumption because we identify it with the patient, then they can implement it. They can't. And and you can't do it. And uh, it's you know it revolves around. I think in psychiatry, there uh, the uh, people in psychiatry are more aware of the field trips, those experiences that they do that yes. are built into the treatment. Yeah. We don't do it, but so we have to sneak it in. And um, so like, even tomorrow we talk about um, in, uh, the instruments, you know, the things we use. 
I really, you know, I warn against using them without the the subsequent implementation. So, you know, remember that too tomorrow. Okay. And conclude. Oh, oh, yes. I'm I'm wondering if what you're talking about as rules are internal as well as external. Yes. For, for example, um, with the with the brain damaged people that you're talking about being idle. One of the reasons that I interpreted their idleness was a result of the fact that the old internal rules didn't work. In other words, their environment was disorganized for them. The sensations they received from their body were different. So that to, when, when you're receiving that kind of disorganized input, even if you are aroused, um, you can't make meaning out of it. Is, you know, is a step that's almost totally you know, it's, it's even totally beyond the imagination. When a, you know, when a, a gentleman comes down and tells you that he's left his arm upstairs in the closet, um, you know, if you're, if you're going to be talking about rules or you're going to be talking about trying to figure out what strategies for sorting out his environment he still has left, is, yeah. is that a rule? Um, because you know, encouraging somebody like that to be in, a, in an unusual environment when their body is in an unusual environment, okay. when you know they go into their room and they don't even recognize it. Okay. Um, what I haven't addressed is the safety. Is also you have to determine. What I haven't had. What's not known a lot about is the level of rules. Okay. For instance, you're talking about this person's rules about motion and space. You know, his arm's not even there. Is deficit. Okay, I haven't addressed that. There's not much known about that. And I think that's what we have to look at. Um, for instance, um, in pediatrics, for an example, you'll get kids in looking at their history again, just as you do in PhysDis, haven't had experiences. There's not enough novelty in the environment. You know, they, they go to school, they sit at home. Coupled that,